I now had seven hours and 57 minutes to crack the case of the egg. Not wanting to be recognized, I decided to disguise myself as a hippie. I just looked stupid. Now, there were two ways I could work this case. Looking, which takes a long time, or listening, which don't take a long time, if you listen to the right bird. I settled for listening to the stool pigeon. Having access to the air, the stool pigeon gets to see most things that happen in penguin bite, which makes him a pretty unpopular guy. I like him. He told me to go to Filthy's, a dive I'd heard of but never been seen in. I was to look out for an erotic dancer who went by the name of Feathers. The club's floor show consisted of some of the most disgusting ornithological perversions I'd ever seen. And after about six hours, I couldn't take any more. The owner of the club came down from his office. I hadn't realized Filthy's was named after him. I asked him where Feathers was. He said he hadn't got a clue. He was right about that. Time don't stand still, so I couldn't either. The egg was getting colder, but maybe the trail was getting warmer. I headed over to Feathers' home address. When I got there, it looked like World War III had started, if I knew what a world war was, or I could count. Feathers was there, and so was the egg, and that's what the trouble was all about. The neighbors were laying into Feathers because they knew that Feathers hadn't laid the egg. I introduced myself and took her to one side. She needed a shoulder to cry on. It was a sad story about not being able to have an egg of her own because of some disgusting medical problem that I don't want to go into here. I felt sorry for her. But if that egg wasn't back with a cod feather, pretty soon a lot of other penguins would have disgusting medical problems too, courtesy of the beaks and the feet. By now, feathers was crying on my entire body. It was time for me and the egg to go. I had to move fast. The feet were itching for trouble, and I just knew that the beaks wouldn't swallow. But now I'd got the egg, there was no problem getting it back to its pop. No, the problem was, would the egg hatch out? We waited. Penguinburg waited. It was like a city of penguins, waiting for something. The kid was fine. The Codfather was delighted. Penguinburg breathed a sigh of relief. And a little bit of regurgitated fish was the order of the day. Everyone we've talked to about animals on this series has been on the right side of the law. Today we're going to talk to someone who's on the wrong side of the law. In his time, he's smuggled protected species, obtained rare birds' eggs for private collectors, stolen animals from zoos. Vic Dagenham, not his real name... That is my real name. Sorry? You just said my real name, didn't you? Oh, I do apologise. Um, oh, right, we'll edit that out. Uh, <clears throat> Dave, Perfleet, how did you get involved in such an unusual criminal activity? Well, I've always liked animals. And my father, Mr Perfleet, I mean, he owned a pet shop, didn't he? And as a lad, I used to obtain tortoises from people's gardens for him to sell in the shop. Tortoise rustling? Yeah. On a good night, I used to have, what, underweight of tortoises in my bag. So what did you do then? Well, I started working with other animals. Dogs, cats, budgies, stick insects, whatever the client wanted. I was always very busy at Christmas time. <laughs> it's funny, that, because a bloke would pay me ten pounds to find a puppy for his kids at Christmas. And then just after Christmas, he paid me £15 to take it away again. <laughs> a dog is not just for Christmas. This is. Right. So you were doing quite well then? Well, I was comfortable. Yes, so comfortable that I believe the big London gang started to take an interest in what you were doing. Well, Mr Cray was impressed with my work, yeah. And we decided that I should leave the country for a few years. Where did you go? Abroad. And you carried on with the same sort of thing? Oh, yeah. Did you ever smuggle live animals at all? Oh, yeah. When you get an animal to relax by tapping on the head and then wearing it as an item of clothing. I mean, a snake would have to make a nice tie or a belt. And if he was with a lady, a small, unconscious animal would pass off as a hat. And a fruit bat would make a nice umbrella. Mm -hmm. 
Were you ever caught? No, never. I come close once when a tie I was wearing woke up and hissed at a customs officer. I told him I had a punctured lung and I got away with it. So it was mostly smuggling that you were involved with then? No, 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 I've done all sorts of things. In Africa now, there's a lot of very old people that haven't got any teeth. So I started a little business of hiring out second-hand monkey teeth for people to be able to chew their food. Well, basically, if I saw a commercial opportunity, I'd take it. So what would you say was your most unusual line of work? Hollywood in America. I've had some very peculiar requests from there. Well, there's a lot of people, and I mean big stars now, I want, them, want small animals delivered direct to their homes in the middle of the night. Now, I don't ask any questions, and I don't hear any lies. But I have heard a lot of squeaking. I can imagine. Right, well, uh, Vic, uh, Dave, thanks very much for talking to us. Oh, oh I'm sorry, we'll, we'll edit that out. That's great. I think these are the ones that he was wearing when he got dengue fever. Mm. Ah, Pete, perhaps you'd like to tell us if today's never-before-seen Sydney kidney film is one of your favourites. Well, it certainly is one of my favourites, because it deals with something that Grandad Kidney took very seriously indeed, cleanliness. Ah, yes, that must have been quite a problem when you were out in the bush. Oh, yes, it was a matter of life and death, and a good friend of Grandad's was once seriously injured by an unwashed vest. Oh, dear. Mm. But Grandad Kidney was very fastidious, and if there was no water available, he would use an old Boy Scout ablutions technique and knock the dirt off himself with a stick. And if there was another explorer present, they would punch each other vigorously until they were clean. He did take it seriously, didn't he? Oh, yes. He once told me that an unwashed body attracted the unwelcome attentions of women, whereas a man who was clean about his ways could pass by unnoticed. Let's see the film, shall we? Hmm. It was Thursday, and I was taking my laundry to Mombasa, 250 miles away, as I did every week. For I had found that soiled clothing, left for longer than a week, would soon become the home of small animals. As usual, the sight and sound of my bicycle caused great excitement amongst the creatures I cycled past. And then I saw an elephant, a huge beast, as big as Dunfermline Town Hall, not counting the library, you understand. I could not resist stopping for a closer look, so I dismounted and approached, carefully on foot. Look at this magnificent old tusker, enjoying a light snack of berries from this berry berry bush. I should think that tusk must weigh as much as a boy scout in full camping gear. Oh, and there's the other one. Thanks to my bushcraft, I'm able to... Oh, oh he's taking my washing. He's putting it in his mouth. Oh, the elephant is devouring my laundry. What, what was I to do? I had no other clothing apart from what was upon my body. With a sinking feeling, I realized that there was only one way that I would ever see my laundry again. Horrible though the prospect was, I decided to wait for it to reappear. Well, fingers crossed. No, no, that's not mine. Oh, dear, dear, dear. 
that's, that's so unpleasant. Oh, let's look at something else. Ah, what's this? Oh, I see. <clears throat> no, I don't recognize this. <sighs> Not that button. I think this elephant has completely digested my wardrobe. I cycled to the next village to see if I could make good any of my losses. The chief was clearly delighted to see me. I asked him if I could borrow a pair of underpants. Because of all the clothing I had lost, the most important item was my change of underpants. For a man cannot last long in the baking sun of Africa without access to fresh small clothes. However, my request started a furious debate as to the nature of this garment. Eventually, however, they understood. <laughs> there were no underpants to be had. But I was offered the hospitality of a bath, which I gratefully accepted, for the events of the last few days had uh, left their mark. I had not realized, however, that what had been referred to as a bath would be more accurately described as a lake. My hosts, sensing my apprehension, insisted on clearing every living creature from the cold, murky waters. However, I found that I was not alone in the waters for very long. Oh. Being hit below the belt by an armadillo put an end to my ablutions, and I emerged from the waters to find a family of wild dogs playing with my underpants. How could you do that to a man's last pair of underpants? Sadly and very carefully, I mounted my bicycle and rode away. Having no laundry to take to Mombasa, I went home. Well, that's all we've got time for in this week's show. Hope you've enjoyed what we've shown you. We'll be back again next week. Hope you will. Good night. Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs>